Well, I'm excited today uh, to begin a new series from the book of Esther entitled, God Remembers You. Esther is written at a time in Israel's history that it would have been easy for a lot of Jewish people to think that God was done with them, that he had forgotten about them. Esther is written for a people who had gone into Babylonian captivity, and it was God's will for them to go into Babylonian captivity because they had become unfaithful and indifferent to him. They were called to belong to him, to honor him, and God was blessing them, but they forgot about him when things got good. And they just did their own thing, and they became autonomous from God, and they started to serve other gods and just do their own thing. And so God, wanting to get his people's heart back to them, to him, enabled and allowed Babylonian uh, empire to come and take captive all the people of Israel and take them into Babylonian captivity. And we read in Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, that it wasn't that God didn't still care for his people, but that God wanted to get their heart back. And this is exactly what he says. This is a famous passage from Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in a future. Now that's in the context of him saying through Jeremiah, now I'm bringing judgment. I'm bringing you to a place you don't want to go. And you're going to go weeping and kicking and screaming because I want to get you back to me. Listen to what he then says. He says, then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. See, God has this bigger picture in mind of your eternal well-being than just your temporary well-being. And when he sees that your heart is going astray from him, God is going to allow judgments to come into your life to sober you, to get your attention, to try to get your heart back to himself. He says, then you will come and call upon me and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and you'll find me when you seek for me with all your heart, and I will bring you back from captivity again. But he even says through Jeremiah, it's going to be 70 years. And we pick up the story of Esther after 70 years has passed. They've been in Babylon. They've been fruitful. They've still been multiplying as the people of God. And God allows a Persian empire to come up and take over Babylon. Uh, Babylon. And so now the, the Israelites, God's people, are now under Persian uh, captivity. But God uses the heart of King Cyrus to allow a remnant of Jews and whoever wants to go to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple and rebuild the walls. You can read about this in Ezra and Nehemiah if you're not familiar with the biblical story. God is now going to restore his people. But Esther is written to the people who decided to stay and not go back to Jerusalem. These are people that even though God now has fulfilled his promise and he said, I still have plans for you and I hope for you, it's going to come at a time 70 years from now. That time has come up, but there's many Jews that chose to just stay put, to, to not go back to Jerusalem. And, and what I want to say, I believe about these people staying put is that they have lost all hope that God really does see and that God really does care. I think this is the equivalent of your modern day raised in church with the knowledge of God, but some bad things have happened and they got a little bit fickle about God and his character and they've gotten used to just being out of church and kind of a part of this culture and a part of the pagan way of life and they're kind of indifferent to the things of God now. And so given the opportunity to go back, they decide they don't want to go back and they're just going to stay what's in what's comfortable. And I wonder if you can relate to that thought process today. Or if you're just going through a season of life where you're losing hope that God sees you still, that God cares, that maybe you've just gone so far your own track, your own way in sin, you know you're far from God, and you think God is indifferent and has forgotten about you and doesn't care. I believe that's where the Israelites of Esther's story are. They've given up on following God back to Israel because they, in part anyways, feel God has maybe given up on them. And what the story of Esther wants to remind us today is even when you feel you're too far gone and you're not even pursuing the things of God anymore 
And maybe you've just been out of church and you're not really thinking about serving God and you're just doing your own thing. Even then, God is still looking out for you. God has not forgotten about you. He is at work protecting you, trying to get you back into his goodness, into his grace. Esther is a story of redemption. God is going to call up this woman, Esther, as his instrument, as his vessel to protect his rebellious people. His people that didn't even go back to rebuild the temple. His unfaithful people, his indifferent people. God is still looking out for them. God is still going to look for ways to bless them, to protect them, to keep them, just to give them every chance to come back. In fact, these are the people that we see when Jesus comes on the scene that were the Samaritans, that the Jews hated, that intermingled with the Gentile, that didn't keep themselves pure. They intermarried with people that followed other gods. And we see in Jesus not a prejudice towards the Samaritans, but a love for them, that he wanted to include them as well in his story. And the same is true of you today. And so let's jump into the book of Esther together, starting in chapter 2. We're going to read verses 5 through 18. And, and we're picking up this story when Esther is first coming on the scene that God is going to use her in a series of coincidences to spare his people, to look out for his people, to protect his people, just like God is working in your life, even when you don't see it, through many different coincidences, divine appointments and providences, to try to protect you and keep you and get you back to himself, even if you've strayed and been unfaithful to him. So read with me, starting verse 5. There was a citadel of Susa, a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin, named Mordecai. He was the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Among those taken captive with Je 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 Jehoiachin, king of Judah. I love all the names in the Old Testament. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This young woman, who was also known as Esther, had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and her mother died. Esther also was taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai, who had charge of the harem. She pleased him and won his favor. Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. Every day he walked back and forth near the courtyard of the harem to find out how Esther was and what was happening to her. Before a young woman's turn came to go into King Xerxes, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for the women, six months with oil of myrrh, and six with perfumes and cosmetics. And this is how she would go to the king. Anything she wanted was to be given to her to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. So this is kind of like a beauty contest going on between hundreds of beautiful women to see who's going to be the next queen and when your time finally came to go and try to impress the king and be the chosen one, you could bring all the bling bling you wanted. That's basically what this is saying. In the evening, she would go there and in the morning return to another part of the harem to, to the care of another king's eunuch who oversaw the concubines. And she would not return to the king unless he was pleased with her and summoned her by name. When the turn came for Esther to go to the king, she asked for nothing so she could take anything she wanted to, to really fancy up, but she took, asked for nothing to come with her other than what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who oversaw the harem, suggested. So she's just following his lead. She's saying, what, what do you say I should bring in to see the king? And Esther then won the favor of everyone who saw her. She was taken to the king Xerxes in the royal residence in the tenth month, the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. Now the king was attracted to Esther more than to any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashanti. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all his nobles and officials. He proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts with royal liberality. So there's a great benefit to God raising up Esther to be this queen. It's just a coincidence. She was of the right age, in the right place, at the right time, with the right look to be chosen. And upon her becoming queen, queen now there are gifts throughout this empire. And, and it, at this time, 
This empire stretched the known world. This is the most powerful man on the planet by far, King Xerxes, and the Persian king. So she is raised up to the second highest position of power in the world, and as a result of God's favor on her life and being raised up to that position, there's gifts distributed throughout the kingdom for everyone in her name. And so it is for us today. I hope you can see the parallel. For God's chosen one, Jesus Christ, who came on our behalf, who rose to the right hand of the Father, who distributes gifts to us freely. It is a good thing that Jesus is Lord today, that he is king because he is good and he wants to be good to all of us and distribute gifts to all of us who would accept his invitation into our lives. And just as it was no coincidence for Esther to be of age and and have all the right makeup to be chosen to be a part of this uh, beauty contest, we're going to see in the coming weeks, it's no coincidence that God has planted you where he's planted you to influence the people around you for his purposes. Even the hard things that you're going through, even the dark times that we're in, both on the world stage and in our personal lives, God is using it all for his divine purposes in the end. And, and we can't forget that behind the scenes, God is always working things to his ends and his means, no matter what the news says and the pundits say. God is on the throne, and God is working all things for our good and his good at the end of the day. It is not a coincidence that a woman that was driving by this church one Sunday at the worst, lowest moment of her life, full of tears behind the wheel, cries out to God as she's passing our church and just finds herself pulling in after being raised in a way that she was taught that the church would reject her and would hate her. And she ended up in the second pew down in front of me, and I had no idea, she didn't want anything to do with me, she didn't even know how she ended up there, But throughout that service, God spoke into her life in such a way that she finally found hope and love and and an overwhelming feeling of contradiction. Everything she had been taught her whole life to believe about God and the church came tumbling down because just by coincidence, she was driving by our church on a Sunday morning at the lowest point and looked over as she cried out for God's help. She had nowhere else to go, and God brought her in, and God revealed himself to her. It's not a coincidence. And now it's falling down and moving down through her kids and her family. It's not a coincidence that I walked into Lanigan Elementary when I did. And I met this wonderful man of God in, in Greg Smith. And, and then through that, I uh, was, was able to meet Khalila Turner and Kasin Turner. who was just clapping and, and excited and gives me encouragement every Sunday. Yeah, I'm trying to get you to imitate her and, and mimic her. She's fresh wind and fresh fire every Sunday for me. But it wasn't a coincidence. I walked in when, when there was a clear moment where I just thought I was making the decision. I just thought I'm going to go in the landing. I'm just going to offer to help. And I hit that door at just the right moment where he needed a pastor and I needed a friend. And then he built a bridge to Khalil and Kasin, who've become friends and beautiful partners. And God's done an amazing work in their life. And now we host a program every Saturday for 14 kids and there's a waiting list on that because God's just so blessing that and it wasn't a coincidence God put that on Michelle's heart and you guys have rallied around that and helped that and now every Saturday for the last several weeks many many kids lives are being shaped for the future all just because of coincidence after coincidence of how God is moving and working at all times trying to get it us to influence but so often our eyes our focus are on all the world's problems or we're just focused on our own problems and we miss because our eyes and our focus are not on jesus opportunities that he is working all around us before us it's not a coincidence that dr joe knight was interim pastor here before i got here and i had just met him and holly at my previous pastor and become started to become friends with him and pam before he became interim pastor here and then upon me coming and being pastor here, he uh, stayed and was a part of the church and was, had a heart to reach the Muslim community. And, and I'm assuming a lot of you know that between Dearborn and Hamtramck, we have like one of the second or third largest population of Muslims in the country, in our own backyard. And then through that connection, we got to meet Dr. Uh, I had not Dr. Uh, Ilyas Mesa, who's like a doctor in my mind. He's a doctor of the gospel. And his family, and now... We just, this last Friday night, we hosted 
a, a Ramadan dinner for them in our church, and we had over 120 Muslims come, and their imam, their teacher, come. And their imam went to Dr. Nanakin after he gave a gospel presentation and grabbed his arm and said, I've never heard that. Can I get your contact information? I want to talk to you about that. It's not a coincidence. The way that God is moving and he's always using people and aligning circumstances for his sake, for his kingdom, that we can all be a part of. God is still on the move. And he's always working, even when we don't see it, even when we don't feel it. If we don't lose hope, even when we don't want him, God is working out ways that he wants us. It's not a coincidence that you were drawn here and are connected to service here along with the neighbors that you have, the coworkers that you have, the family that you have. God in his foreknowledge knew exactly where you're at right now, where you'd be at this time in history. He has planted us here at this time for his kingdom's sake and he saw it all before it came to be and he is preparing all things to, for us to connect to him and to move and propel his kingdom purposes forward no matter how it looks. God is moving. God is protecting. God is doing things behind the scenes. I want to share a story quickly for you speaking of God's providence and God's foreknowledge and God moving in, in ways we can't see that are perfect according to his knowledge, even when we don't feel it. In Ecuadorial Africa, far from any pharmacies or hospitals, a woman died in childbirth, leaving behind a grieving two-year-old daughter and a premature baby in danger of succumbing to the chill of the night. With no incubator, no electricity, and few supplies, a newborn's life was in jeopardy. A helper filled a hot water bottle to provide the warmth of the, the infant so desperately needed, but suddenly that hot water bottle, the rubber burst on it. It was the last hot water bottle in the village. A visiting missionary physician from Northern Ireland, Dr. Helene Rosevere, asked the orphans of the village to pray with her for the situation. And there, a 10-year-old orphan, Ruth, seemed to go too far and left this doctor speechless. She said, please, God, send us a water bottle. It'll be no good to come tomorrow. The baby will be dead, so please send it by this afternoon. And as if that request was not sufficiently audacious, she added this, And while you're at it, God, would you please send a dolly for this little girl so she'll know you really love her? Rosevere said she was put on the spot and honestly couldn't even say amen because she just did not believe that God could do this. Oh yes, I know that he can do everything. The Bible says so. But there are limits, aren't there? Their only hope of getting a water bottle would be in a parcel sent from Ireland, where this doctor was from, but Rosevere had never received one thing during the four years she had lived there. Anyway, she mused, if anyone did send a parcel, who would put in a hot water bottle? We live on the equator. A couple of hours later, a car dropped off a 22-pound package. The orphans helped open it and sort through the contents, some, of, some clothing, bandages, and a bit of food. Rosevere recalls, as I put my hand in again, I felt, could it really be? I grasped it and pulled it out. Yes, a brand new rubber hot water bottle. I had not asked God to send it. I didn't even believe that he could or that he would. But then little Ruth, the 10-year-old orphan, rushed in and she said, if God sent this water bottle, then I know he sent a dolly too. Sure enough, she dug through the packaging and found a beautifully dressed doll at the bottom of the parcel. And she said, Mommy, can I give this dolly to the little girl that she'll know that God really loves her? That parcel had been packed five months earlier by Rosevere's former Sunday school class. The leader kept feeling God's prompting to include a hot water bottle and a little girl contributed doll. And of course, that package, the only one ever to arrive during Rosevere's time in Africa, was delivered the same day that Ruth prayed for it with the faith of a child.
And I just want to remind us today, God sees, God knows, and God cares. God saw that prayer coming five months previous. And God was working on an instrument, a vessel that he could use and prompting it to deliver at just the right moment, at just the right time, what was needed to see his hand, his providential hand at work. And some of you, you are in a dark season. And maybe it's been three months or four months or six months. But I want to remind you through this story of Esther that God has been at work. And he saw you're going to be here in advance. And he is still at work. Don't give up hope. He is going to bring something in his right time that you need to keep on going, to take the next step, to show you once again he sees and he knows and he loves and he wants to provide. And you might be, in fact, that answer. We're going to have a gentleman come at the end of the month. I'm so excited about this. Named Jonathan Almonte that I got to meet out of the Dominican Republic on my trip there as we brought last year through Compassion International sponsorship of over 20 kids in the Dominican Republic at a Nazarene church that's doing all kinds of good. They've got an insane amount of kids they're trying to support. We uh, were able to build a crisis center for moms there. And uh, so through that partnership, I got to meet this young man named Jonathan Almonte who was born into a situation where his dad had a second family, was very hard-hearted, never told him that he loved him. And, and so he wouldn't even support financially his mom or him, even though he was very wealthy because he was busy supporting this side family. And so he would be in the streets selling juice, didn't even have uh, shoes to wear. His friend, uh, over time, allowed him to borrow a school uniform in the afternoons uh, to be able to get educated. So he'd be selling juice in the morning and then run off to school in the afternoon. And through that school, uh, he was able to get a partnership with a compassion, a compassion sponsor. And that compa- compassion sponsor is in Michigan, and we're going to try to get her here as well, that you can hear her story. But here's the thing. In God's timing, in God's province that came to Jonathan through this sponsor, just the simple word, words of this, Jonathan, no matter what you do, no matter what you do, I love you, I will always love you, and God loves you and will always love you. And he had never heard that in his life. And hearing that and receiving those letters every month, along with that financial support that showed that love, completely transformed his heart and his life and his mind. And today, he is a foremost leader in the Dominican Republic, helping other kids come out of poverty in the name of Jesus Christ, full of the love of Jesus Christ, and he was able to get his father in as well. God, at your lowest moment, might just be tomorrow bringing the right person into your life as his hands and feet to show you that he sees and he knows and he cares, to pull you out of discouragement, to give you hope and a future, as he said. I know the plans I have for you. And it's not just for the people that are going back that are faithful. Even you who have become indifferent, even you who have just stayed put and and just grown a little bit fractured in your relationship with me, you're you're just not even going to go back to do my bidding when given the opportunity. I'm still looking out for you through Esther. I care for you. I wonder, are you preparing yourself the way that Esther prepared herself to meet with the king? You know, God is always at work to prepare you for your meeting with him. He is always bringing in providential relationships and opportunities around you, trying to get you to see his goodness, his love, his care for you, so that you'll be prepared to enter into eternity with him. And if you will accept his invitation and come as you are, no matter how messy you are, God will enter into your life and he will do a work in your life to help you be of influence for others. 
He doesn't just want to clean you up and help you come out of a place of hopelessness and despair and discouragement and brokenness. He wants to then turn you around and fill you with his love in such a way that he can use your story to help others who are broken and discouraged and without hope, to bring them as well to the Father. But here's the thing about Esther that we have to decide. Esther Listen to the one who knew the king best before meeting him in terms of what to bring into the meeting. She was humble. She listened to Mordecai and followed his instructions about not sharing her ethnic background. She was humble in listening to Haggai and finding favor with him, who was the king's right-hand man. And we, too, have the Holy Spirit in the Scriptures to do the same, to humble ourselves. To say, Jesus, what do you want? What do you need from me in my life? You know, Jesus said this in his ministry, many people are called, but few are chosen. And the word chosen there in Matthew 22 refers to those who willingly receive his invitation. He's not going to twist your arm. He's not going to force himself on you. He's not going to rule over you. He's trying to woo you and influence you to himself. We're in a time today where people think they know the gospel and they've rejected it. And just as Mordecai had told Esther not to share her ethnic backgrounds as a means of losing favor with the king, I'm convinced that we have to live Christianity more than we speak of it to find favor with man today. Nobody responds well to being controlled or attempted to rule, be ruled over. God doesn't do that to us, and he doesn't want us to just be out there mouthing off and, and you know, telling everybody how awful they are and how wrong they are. He wants us to embody the heart and the spirit of Christ that would win people with our actions more than our words. Loving spirits and loving deeds. And that's what this mission month is all about, is showing the goodness of God in the spirit of God, that people could open their hearts to God. Esther became an influencer God could use because she was humble to listen to Mordecai, listen to Haggai, and I want to remind us that God's beautification process towards our final meeting with him, with Jesus, is about listening to scripture and the spirit's application to our lives. Are we letting the scripture shape us? Are we listening to what it has to say to us about beautifying ourselves for God? Jesus says that he is here to help us to apply it to our lives. We have the Holy Spirit. We have power from on high to beautify our soul, to be ready for our meeting. And this is what it says of our meeting. I'm just going to read a couple passages real quickly. It says of us that we ought to be a people that even when people don't believe the word of God, they may be won over without words by our behavior because they see the purity and reverence of our lives. That our beauty as Christians, thank God, it's not about outer adornment. It's about the person of the heart. And while the world is chasing all the elaborate hairstyles and the latest trends and all the jewelry and fine clothes, the church of Jesus Christ is to be seeking after the unfading beauty of a gentle spirit that's reverent and ready to bless people in Jesus' name. Ephesians tells us that we're to put off the old self and to put on the new self that's created to be like God. And what that looks like practically, he says, he says, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only speak that which is helpful for building others up according to their needs. See, I didn't get any applause on that one. <laughs> that it may benefit the listener. Get rid of your bitterness and your anger and your rage and your slander and the gossip. Be rather kind. Kindness means I'm looking for ways to do good for somebody. I'm taking the opportunities that God has given me, the divine appointments, the providential relationships of the coworkers and the family and the friends, and I'm saying, God, what have you given me in my gift set, in my makeup, that I can do to bless, to be kind, to do good to people? You know, one of my favorite people here had car trouble, and, and um, 
his car was stuck out here in the parking lot for a little while and uh, a Christian brother told me uh, that's out in Brighton, he goes, you know what, I got a friend who uh, can do this and can do this really cheap and he pays to come all the way out from Brighton to our parking lot to tow this guy's vehicle to his guy to pay for this fix that this guy now can have his car in working area. You say, well, that's elaborate and unnecessary. But I know the guy who did this, and he wasn't doing it just for my friend. He was doing it for his friend Jesus, who had done it for him. That's the kind of thing that we ought to be looking to do all the time. I have an opportunity to serve Jesus. This guy has a car need. It came to me. I can't look at that as a coincidence that it came to me. I got to look at it as an opportunity that came to me to serve God, to show off the goodness of God, to be like Jesus. This is what it means to be new in the attitude of your mind. Be kind and compassionate. That's what he was. He was compassionate. He had a heart for my friend. He says, man, what would I want somebody to do for me in this situation? And I've got a connection, and I'm going to do it. And then listen how Paul ends this section, and this is us today. Wake up, sleeper, you who are, who are asleep at the wheel. You who are just becoming different to the things of God, I start off telling you, God has been working to woo you back. God is putting things in your life to get you back. And, and now God is saying, hey, today, it's not a coincidence that you're here. It's not a coincidence that you're hearing my voice right now. The Holy Spirit is wanting to speak to you. Wake up! The, the meeting with the king is coming, and it cannot be avoided. I heard John Lennox say the other day to an atheist, atheist said, oh, you just need God for comfort. And he said, well, you need atheism for the comfort of not meeting God. Everybody is going to stand before the king, whether you're prepared or not prepared. And the king loves you so much, he's doing everything behind the scenes he can. The good, the bad, the ugly. He's working out all things, trying to to get you to himself. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you, plans to give you a hope and a future, plans to come into your life and use you as my vessel to be a blessing for other people. Will you work with me? Will you let me have my way? I love you too much to let you go easy. I'm going to make it even miserable for you at times if I have to. To sober you up, that you need me, to get you to call on my name again, to get you to seek me with all your heart again. Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. King Xerxes' favor shine on Esther. And listen to what he says here. Don't be foolish. Understand what the, Lord, what the will of the Lord is. It is foolish for us today to not understand what the will of the Lord is for our lives because we're going to meet him. and We're going to an accounting of our lives. It's a gift from him. And he is good and he is loving and he is working to include us in relationship with himself and to include us in his mission and his purposes, to give us dignity, value, and worth. And so sober up and don't be foolish and miss what God is doing in your life. You're one person away, you're one prayer away from God getting you back on track again. Take your focus off your problems and the problems of this world. And put your focus on Jesus, who once again says this, I've not forgotten you. I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. Call on me, and I will listen. You will find me when you seek me with all your heart, and I will bring you back from the, from the captivity that you're in. Captivity to sin, captivity to what other people think about you, captivity to your own being your own worst enemy where you're doing a lot of damage that's unnecessary if you let the Lord come into your life. As God raised up Esther, himself came in Jesus to pour out blessing on your life. And the blessing is his Holy Spirit coming and entering in and you being part of the palace of the kingdom of heaven. You can have your sins forgiven. You can be reconciled to God. You can have all the blessings in your life. And sometimes, yes, there's weeping. It's not easy. There's seasons of hardship, even as a Christian, 
where God is trying to work the character of Christ into you. But at the end of the day, there's only one way, the best way, is to be under the lordship of Jesus and his kingdom. And so in closing today, I'm going to invite you to accept God's plans for your life. And especially if you're here today and you're kind of like where the Israelites were at, maybe you feel like you've missed opportunities. God's called you into something that you said, you know what, no, I don't want to do it. Just like this remnant of Israelites that went back to do these great things and rebuild Jerusalem and the temple and the temple, uh, the Jerusalem walls and and you say, you know what, I, I've, I've missed the mark and I've fallen short and I've been selfish and I've just done my own thing and I've gotten comfortable and I've become indifferent. Does God really want me? Yes, God here is, believe it or not, using a wretch like me to try to speak to you to say, I have not forgotten you and I still want you. And I'm a living testimony to that and you can be a living testimony to the grace of God despite yourself. And so we come to communion today and, you know, communion is not, you don't have to be a member of this church to take communion. Communion is really like a renewal of wedding vows. We can all relate to different seasons in our marriage and and it's the same in our relationship with God. There's different seasons that come. And we need communion to remember once again the faithful covenant partner we have in Jesus who will not give up on us. Who will not set us aside. When we've set him aside, he's still providentially working through people to get us back. And he wants you back today. And so communion for you, you can participate with us whether you officially belong to this church or not. If you say, I want to be in relationship with Jesus. I come into agreement with Jesus that I have been a a sinner, I've gone my own way, I've done my own thing, and I want to get back on track. Jesus, if you'll have me, I'll have you. If it's true that you'll bring me back into your good graces, God, here I am, take me. See, this is a vow that's symbolic like a wedding ring to say, Jesus, I once again receive you. I receive your mercy as revealed by the blood. I receive your life, your love as symbolized by bread to energize me, to cleanse me, to use me, fill me full to overflowing God. So this is a time of thanksgiving for his mercy, his kindness, his patience for us. And it's a time for us to reflect upon our commitment back to him, to say, Lord, I want to get back. I'm ready to get on track. So Heavenly Father, would you do what only you can do today in Jesus' name? And minister to our hearts this morning once again of your providential love. Lord, I pray for everybody especially that's just been in a dark season, a hard season, who thinks you've forgotten about them, who's almost projecting onto you their own lethargic attitude and indifference because they feel forgotten they feel overlooked they're comfortable in the ways of this world Jesus today would you just give us hope would you put the light of Christ in our hearts again that we are loved and that you are working even when we don't see it and if we'll take our focus off of the problems the problems of this world, our personal problems, and we'll get our focus back onto you. That Jesus, you can move and work in ways that are beyond what we could imagine possible. That God, you have a person, an intercessor, as your hands and feet to step in at just the right times. 
to remind us once again that you see, that you know, that you love, that you care. And so, Lord, we need your mercy today. As we sang earlier, our sins are many, but we thank you that your grace and your mercy are more. And so we come with grateful hearts this morning to communion. And I just pray, God, you would let the weightiness of this moment set in for us, the weightiness of your love set in for us, the weightiness of our sin set in for us, that we could be truly grateful for clean hearts and clean hands in Jesus' name, no matter what we've done, no matter where we've been, that today is the day of salvation. Today is another day to get on track. And so we give thanks, and we remember your words now, Jesus. That you took some bread at the Passover meal with your disciples. And you blessed it, and you broke it like you bless us, and break us of all of our self-sufficiencies and our rebellious ways. And you gave it. And you said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you that you could be made whole again. Let's break and take together. Likewise, Jesus then took a cup and he gave thanks. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's take and drink together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for willingly going to that cross on our behalf. That you... Lord, could blot out all our transgressions and pay the price in full so that we can have a clear conscience and a pure heart, that we are forgiven, that we are accepted, that you haven't given up on us, that there's still hope for us, that you are completely dedicated to us, even in times we're not completely dedicated to you. And Jesus, for anybody whose heart's gone astray, I pray for a fresh revelation of your goodness today, of your grace today that would influence them and woo them back to once again giving their heart fully to you and remembering that you are good and your love endures forever. To you be the praise now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen.